Hello, this is Tracy Koch, and I'm lecturing on Chapter 10 for the Enzyme and Collagen Disorders. It corresponds with Chapter 10 in your textbook. This is a pretty lengthy, um, lengthy chapter, so there's a lot of information and a lot of content, so I'll try to be as clear as I can and succinct as I can, but um, let me know if you have any questions. You can always email me uh, through the course email. All right, so getting started, uh, we're going to start off with um, how the human body functions. It requires daily genomic activity to produce, maintain, and recycle proteins. Genetic mutations can disrupt the production of proteins, specifically enzymes and different types of collagen, which then has a negative impact on the overall physiologic function of the organism or the person. An enzyme is a biological catalyst. It causes a biochemical reaction to occur, or it increases the rate of a spe specific biochemical reaction within a cell, body tissue, or organ. Known mutations in common enzymes can result in either the accumulation of excess amounts of the specific amino acid, or the buildup of a precursor product with lysosomes. So that creates two different disorders. Um, lysosomal storage diseases or hyperaminoacidemias. And that's what we're going to be talking about in this chapter. Here's a graphic depiction of that, how you have normal enzyme activity and then you have your final product. But if you have a deficient enzyme action, you can have an excessive buildup of those precursor substances and you have low or absent amounts of the final product and that is how you get the disorder or the deficiency. Some common facts genetic, on genetic enzyme deficiencies. Neither parent will have an obvious problem. The affected newborn does not have any symptoms at birth. Maternal enzymes will cross the placenta and perform the specific functions in the fetal cells, so that's why you don't see symptoms right off the bat in a newborn. And many di enzyme disorders can be cured by um, hemopoietic stem cell transplantation, or S. HSCT, which you'll see that abbreviation a lot when we're talking about the different enzyme disorders. Um, that procedure, however, is very costly and very dangerous. So these are the examples of hyperaminoacidemias, and you'll recognize some of those, particularly PKU or maple syrup urine disease. And our examples of lysosomal storage disorders are listed here. Um, you have enzymes within those lysosomes that are defective, which causes the buildup of the precursor substances and then causes the toxicity within the cells, as in with these lysosomal storage diseases. So we're going to back up a little bit and talk about PKU, and most of you know about uh, PKU, especially if you've worked with the newborns and you know that we screen for it in um, every state with newborn screening tests. The mutated gene PAH results in the deficiency of phenylalanine hydrolyse, hydro, hydroxylase, and it's an accepted, excessive buildup of the phenylalanine. So this excessive buildup will cause a deficiency of tyrosine. This is an autosomal recessive disorder, and we see it in 1 in 10,000 live births. It's most common in European Americans from Ireland and Scotland. The pathophysiology um, PKU is that you have excessive amounts building up, and the phenylpyruvate buildup in the blood and other body fluids, which causes a low pH in the blood. Um, they're also in the urine, and um, growth brain function and neurotransmitter production are reduced and your tyrosine levels are low. And this is not compatible with um, a healthy life. Signs and symptoms, if this is not managed, you would see some severe cognitive impairment, small stature, small head size, poor motor skills, um, light skin, hair and eye color, tremors and seizure activity, and a musty or mousy odor of, of a sweat, breath, and urine.
The management of PKU is a very strict dietary restriction of the phenylalanine intake. So a special formula or special um, medical formula for um, babies born with this. It's a lifelong restriction. It's less severe after your brain development is complete, but for the most part, management is a lifelong restriction of this. There is some drug therapy that will improve the conversion of phenylalanine to tyrosine, um, and that drug is um, saproperitin or Cuvan, and I don't really know much about the drug personally, except that it is, it is expensive, of course, as um, any of these specialized drugs would be. Gaucher's disease is a mutated um, beta-glucoside gene. It results in the excess buildup of um, glycosaccharamide in the lysosomes of macrophages and other white blood cells. This is an autosomal recessive disorder. The incidence is 1 in 450 live births, and we see it more prevalent among Ashkenazi Jewish descent. It's high among French Canadians in Quebec, and in the general population, it's 1 in 40,000 to 100,000 live births. There are different types of Gaucher's, Gaucher's disease. Type 1 is non neuronopathic and it's a buildup of the macrophages in the liver, spleen, bone marrow, and lungs, but not in the central nervous system. So this is the most common type that we see. Type 2 is acute um, neuronopathic infantile, which is a, the buildup is a severe in the central nervous system, and this leads to an early death. Type 3 is chronic neuronopathic, and it's the central nervous system is affected, but not as severely as in type 2, and this is very rare. So type 1 is what you most commonly would see. In type 1, you have huge amounts of the glucosaceramide. It collects in the macrophages of your liver, spleen, bone marrow, and lungs. So this results in enlarged organs. These large macrophages will exert pressure on nearby cells in the organ, and that's what causes the... Um, organ enlargement, and it also decreases your perfusion and oxygenation, so therefore decreasing the function of the organ and shortening the life. Um, signs and symptoms, when it's not managed, you would see protruding abdomen with large liver and spleen, which makes sense because you have the macrophages causing this pressure and enlargement of the organ. Thrombocytopenia and easy bruising, anemia, fatigue, bone pain, osteoporosis, um, pathologic fractures, short stature, and a premature death, death if it goes untreated. So management of this would be vitamin supplementation, platelet and red um, blood cell growth factors to stimulate bone marrow um, production, um, transfusions, splenectomy, um, biophosphonates to prevent the bone density loss, joint joint prosthesis, there is enzyme replacement therapy or a stem cell transplant. So moving on to Hurler syndrome, this is uh, the mutated alpha L hydronidase gene and it results in an, an excessive buildup of mucopolysaccharides in the lysosomes of most cells. It's also known as MPS1. It's an autosomal recessive disorder, the incidence is 1 in 1,000 live births. Um, Hurler syndrome is um, when you have huge amounts of the mucopolysaccharides or the GAGs collecting in the lysosomes um, of your macrophages in your cells, the basement membranes between the tissues and the blood vessels, um, you have this collection of, of the um, GAGs, and this uh, reduces your organ function, especially in your liver, brain, and lungs, and shortens life. Um, your symptoms would be coarse facial features, large head, a prominent forehead, thick lips, heavy eyebrows, short neck, short stature, spinal deformities, severe cognitive impairment, abdominal enlargement, respiratory infections, and premature death within five to ten years. So again, the management would be an enzyme replacement therapy. Um, it's very expensive. It is um, administered 
uh, intravenously and um, uh, weekly infusions are required for this so it is expensive um, there really used to only be supportive care but now we do have uh, some options with these drugs that are available there's drug therapy for respiratory infections and drug therapy to improve cardiac output. And again, the stem cell um, transplantation would be an option, but again, it's risky and very expensive. Uh, another syndrome is Hunter syndrome. It's very closely related to Hurler syndrome. It's a, also a lysosomal storage disease where you have an accumulation of the mucopolysaccharides um, this is known as MPS2. It's located, um, it's an X-linked recessive gene located on XQ28. You don't need to know that. Um, but the incidence is 1 in 100,000 to 170,000 live births. This disorder affects mostly males exclusively. The pathophysiology of this is you have, again, an accumulation that collects in your lysosomes of the GAGs and the macrophages, and it too um, causes the disruption of these basin, basement membranes between the tissues and the vessels, um, eventually changing organ function in the liver, brain, and lungs, and shortening the lifespan. It's almost identical to Hunter syndrome. It is a little bit confusing, um, or Hurler syndrome, sorry. Uh, so it's a little confusing between these two. They're very similar, but you'll notice that the physical attributes are very similar. Um, coarse facial features, a large head, short neck, short stature, and premature death. Um, although they do live longer with Hunter syndrome than Hurler syndrome. There is a much slower onset of symptoms with Hunter syndrome than Hurler syndrome. Like the other disorders, there is some enzyme replacement therapy available to these patients. It's very expensive. Uh, the drug therapy um, to manage respiratory infections, of course, would also be utilized. And again, the hematopoietic stem cell transplantation is an option for patients with this disease. I know we're blowing through these kind of fast. They're all in your textbook. And I really just want to give you an overview of what the lysosomal storage diseases are like um, and a brief overview of the management. Fabraise disease is another lysosomal storage disease, and this is a mutated alpha -galacto galaxodase A gene. It results, again, in an excess buildup of GL3 in your lysosomes and many other tissues. So you can kind of see the pattern here of lysosomal storage diseases. We get an excess and a buildup, and it disrupts the membranes of the cells, um, causing many of the symptoms and problems in the vessels and organs. This, too, is an X-linked recessive disorder. Its incidence is 1 in 40,000 to 60,000 live births. It affects males almost exclusively. Female carriers may have some of the symptoms. In Febreze disease, we have a degradation of the GL3. It's part of the recycling of old red blood cells and other cells, so large amounts of this and a toxic metabolite in the blood and lysosomes damages your vessels, reducing perfusion, and as they become less efficient, you have chronic inflammation leading to ischemia and eventual organ and tissue damage and organ failure. Signs and symptoms, it usually begins in later childhood, um, males earlier than females, cold intolerance, heat intolerance, iopacities, numbness of fingers and toes, skin, um, angiokeratomas, reduced heart, kidney, and brain function, renal failure, strokes, premature, or uh, hearing problems, and premature death within 20 to 40 years. So not as um, quickly progressive as the other disorders, um, but nonetheless can be pretty devastating. So as soon as it's diagnosed, um, enzyme replacement therapy should be begun. And there are two different options here with the uh, Ripligel and um, Febra enzyme. Makes sense. Um, 
there's a drug that stabilizes the enzyme, and that's called Galifold or Meglistat. Drug therapy will slow the progression of the kidney disease, reduce brain perfusion, reduce my myocardial perfusion. Um, they don't typically prolong life, though, however. Okay, moving on to Tay-Sachs disease. Most of you have heard of this. Um, it is a mutated beta hex amandice A gene. It results in the excess buildup of GM2 gangliosides in the brain cells. This is an autosomal recessive disorder. The incidence is one in 3,900 live births, again, with a prevalence in the Ashkenazi Jewish population. The general population is about one in 320,000 live births. You get huge amounts of the GM2 gangliosides collecting in the cells particularly in neurons, so this causes them to balloon up in size and lose function over time. Death occurs um, usually by age two, usually from pneumonia. Problems are noted early on between four and six months of age. Um, your normal intellectual and motor development will um, stop and then regress. Uh, patients have a pale retina with a cherry red fovea as a physical finding. You see progressive muscle weakness and paralysis, loss of normal reflexes, hyperactive startle reflex, blindness, seizure activity, and premature death within two to four years. So up until that point, uh, these babies will look like they're developing normally, and then around four to six months of age, you start to see this um, progression stop and then um, a regression uh, start in, in terms of development. Uh, Tysacks is um, managed, I don't know where that slide went, it's uh, managed um, only by giving supportive care and emotional support. There's really no therapy or replacement enzymes available and stem cell uh, transplant is not uh, an option for these patients. It's, uh, like I said, premature death within two to four years, and there really is no management or therapy. So offering emotional support to the family and um, genetic counseling to them is really vital. So we're going to move on to collagen disorders. Collagen is a group of different types of glycoprotein fibers. They start as pro-collagen, forming a major part of connective tissue in all, um, in all the body tissues. Pro-collagen is processed or modified in many ways to form different types of mature collagen fibers that work with elastin and fibrillin to add strength and structure, structure to most tissues. So it basically holds your tissues together, promotes communication between and among your cells, and offers um, strength. The production of different types of pro-collagen um, and the modification steps are genetically controlled, and you can have mutations um, within this production. It affects, or within this cascade of production, that'll affect the composition um, of the collagen types. It might interfere with the assembly and association of other molecules that would result in the collagen disorder. So your communication might be disrupted uh, with these certain mutations. There are different collagen types, um, so it's helpful to know the different ones. Your most common is type 1. It's in your bones, skin, tendons, ligaments, corneas, um, intervertebral discs, blood vessels in the walls. Type 2 is the major type found um, in cartilage. Type 3 is the major component of connective tissue in your lungs, intestinal walls, blood, and your blood vessel walls. Type 4 is the major component of connective tissue in the kidneys and inner ear. And type 5 is um, works with other types to provide strength in connective tissues and kind of that um, matrix in the ligaments, bones, tendons, and muscles. The different disorders that we're going to talk about are osteogenesis and imperfecta. Ehlers-Danlos syndrome and Marfan syndrome. 
So all of these probably sound a little bit familiar to you. Uh, we'll go through each of them in a little bit more detail. Osteogenesis imperfecta is um, something that I uh, see pretty commonly in the pediatric population. It's a group of genetic disorders in which collagen formation is impaired. It results in bones that are easily fractured. There are many different mutations, especially in the genes for type 1 collagen, so it results in a variation of um, disease severity. This is an autosomal dominant transmission. The um, incidence in type 1 is about 1 in 15,000 to 30,000 live births. That's the most common is type 1. Um, the pathophysiology is the failure to produce at least one functional chain of pro-collagen. It causes developing bones to have less structural integrity because that matrix, is, matrix isn't being laid down um, and it has less strength, so there's an increased risk for fractures. The severity is related to both the degree of normal collagen uh, reduction um, in the bone and whether or not abnormal collagen is being produced. So there are four main types of osteogenesis imperfecta, or OI. Um, type 1 is where you have reduced amounts of normal collagen, so you, the production of your collagen is reduced. So you have fractures um, in response to minor trauma, and they have a blue tinge coloration of the sclera. Type 2, you have no normal collagen produced. So this is the most severe type. Bone fractures and skeletal malformations occur prenatally, and it's lethal. Type 3, collagen is the collagen that is produced is abnormal. So fractures and skeletal deformities are present at birth. They continue throughout the lifespan. Um, physical findings would be a short statue, stature, muscle weakness, hearing loss, joint laxity, a blue sclera and broke teeth. There's some restrictive pulmonary disease and a reduced lifespan with this um, type 3 of OI as well. This is a picture of an infant in x-ray with um, osteogenesis imperfecta. Multiple broken bones in the extremities. I mean, these are really severe and sad, sad cases. Type 4 is when you have abnormal collagen production um, or the collagen that's produced is abnormal, rather. It functions better than in the other OI types. You might have some scleral coloration um, that is normal, and you have fewer fractures and fewer deformities. So type 4 is your least um, severe type. Management really um, focuses on prevention strategies of fractures, physical therapy, um, management of fractures, braces and support um, for legs, ankles, knees, and wrists, surgical implantation of long bone rods, and the use of canes, walkers, wheelchairs to reduce stress on your weight-bearing bones. So it's really just a disease of management um, and educating the families um, and the patients on uh, preventing fractures as much as they can. Ehlers-Danlos is um, a group of inherited disorders that occur as a result of mutations in the genes responsible for collagen formation or modification. The disorders vary in severity and tissues involved. Transmission patterns vary by type, but mostly they are autosomal dominant. Collectively, the incidence is 1 in 5,000 live births. Classical Ehlers-Danlos is a formerly type 1 or type 2, it's caused by gene mutations for type 1 or type 5 collagen. So remember our types of collagen, so the type 1 and type 5 are what is affected, and it's autosomal dominant. Hypermobility Ehlers-Danlos is formerly type 3, and there's no specific collagen mutation known. It is an autosomal dominant trait as well. Type, formerly type 4 vascular Ehlers-Danlos is caused by gene mutation for type 3 collagen, and that is also autosomal dominant. So if you think about type 3 collagen and um, think about what that is, a major component of the connective tissue in lungs, intestinal walls, and blood vessels, um, that's why it's named vascular. 
in kyphoscoliosis, Ehlers-Danlos is formerly type um, 6, caused by mutation in the gene responsible for modifying collagen, and this is an autosomal recessive. So they've renamed the Ehlers-Danlos um, uh, types, and those are um, in the textbook that you can review. Signs and symptoms of the classical, your skins and joints are hyperextensible and stretchy. Your skin's very fragile, chronic joint pain. This is the most mild disease type. The hypermobile um, type is chronic joint pain, extensible skin. It's not as fragile, um, but you have hypermobile joints with subluxation and dislocation frequently. This is a picture of the stretchiness of a skin with a person with classical ehlers danlos Signs and symptoms of the vascular would be thin and fragile skin, short stature, small face, thin walls of arteries and intestines, and severe um, disease with an early death. For the kyphoscoliosis, you have laxity of all joints, which is present at birth, and a progressive spinal curvature and muscle weakness. This is also a severe di disease with an um, early death. There's really, again, no cure for any type of Ehlers-Danlos. Uh, management strategies will vary, um, but you focus on protecting the joints, delaying complications, avoiding trauma, and utilizing physical therapy. We're going to move on to Marfan syndrome. And most of you have heard of this. It's a connective tissue disorder in which the gene for fibrillin is mutated. This prevents fibrillin from interacting with collagen and elastin to provide recoil strength to tissues during and after stretching. It is an autosomal dominant transmission, relatively high spontaneous mutation rate. The incidence is 1 in 5,000 live births. The pathophysiology is that you have too little fibrillin present to limit the stretch of tissues and allow return to original resting shape, so the dynamic strength of the connective tissue is reduced. The major gene affected is FBN1, which is large uh, and it's expressed in many tissues. Connective tissue is unstable and weak. It becomes overstretched with time and remains overstretched, so it doesn't recoil and go back to that original shape. The effects of the mutation are widespread and they vary amongst patients. Signs and symptoms, uh, again, manifestations vary even within one single family. The affected individuals um, usually have many signs and symptoms, but they rarely have all possible manifestations. Most commonly, um, symptoms are of skeletal, ocular, and cardiovascular systems. The cardiovascular problems are the most common cause of premature death, which is what we hear about um, when we hear about patients with Marfan. Signs and symptoms. These are tall, lanky folks with um, arm spread width, which is greater than their height. They have loose or lax joints, very long and hyperextendable fingers. Spinal curvatures are common, chest deformities are also common. Narrow arched palate, um, crowded teeth, and a smaller regressed chin is also a physical finding you might notice. Um, in some patients, we see downward slanting palpable fissures, flat corneas, displaced or detached lenses, myopia, and small irises. Many patients will have cardiac findings of mitral valve prolapse, a widened aorta, aortic aneurysms, a left ventricular enlargement, or cardiomyopathy. This is a young man who's got Marfan syndrome, and you can see his chest deformity with a downward slanting palpable fissures and a small chin. The management of Marfan's is monitoring and protecting the cardiovascular system. Um, with a yearly evaluation of your um, left ejection function, ejection fraction, mitral valve function, and aortic width. So uh, yearly screening with um, um, cardiac or cardiologist um, and having the um, maybe a stress echo done or echocardiogram done. You want to maintain blood pressure within the normal range, determine the need for surgical interventions if you have a widening aorta or um, heart valve function is failing. You might need a valve replacement. 
Patients should maintain a healthy weight, avoid strenuous exercises, heavy lifting and contact sports. However, regular exercise like walking, recreational swimming, low intensity, bicycling and golfing are encouraged to maintain um, cardiac health. So I know this content was prevent presented pretty quickly um, and there is a lot of content here. But if you have questions, please contact me um, via email, uh, tacoke at lcsc.edu. Of course, my address is also on the syllabus. Um, but hopefully you got some meaningful content out of this lecture. And there will be a case study with the assignments um, on Blackboard. Thanks for your attention.